to the first webinar, Helpful Folk webinar of 2022. When we're where we're going to consider what opportunities exist for real retail businesses in 2022. The purpose of our Helpful Folks um, webinars is to bring you an expert a speaker who you would not normally have access to on a topical subject, um, which in this case is rural retail, and really to give you an opportunity to hear from that expert. And hopefully that can help you as you're deci making decisions for your business for the coming year. It's been a difficult time for a lot of people since the pandemic started 2019, early uh, 20. But actually it has created some, some sort of a rural renaissance in terms of business in the countryside, particularly hospitality with staycations, people supporting more farm shops. Um, Mark will go obviously into more detail, but is that sustainable? Will that carry on throughout this coming year? Will it revert to type? So we are really, really fortunate that Mark's given up his morning to be with us. Mark um, has a long background. Well, sorry, Mark, you're not that old. Um, you're not that old, but uh, it is. Mark, Mark's got the, um, the, the benefit of A, having a rural background, but also being involved in marketing, rural marketing and, and, and in, in the big league of, of marketing. So I like to think he's very well placed. Thank you, Mark, for making time. Um, just before I hand over to you, uh, there will be an opportunity for questions, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, for those that of you who have never uh, dealt with a webinar before, if you look along the top of your screen, you'll find a, a little speech bubble with a question mark in it. So if you'd like to go on to there and then Mark and um, we'll deal with the questions. I think Mark will try and let you do your presentation before we do the questions unless there's something really burning a question that, that's relevant. OK, if we don't get time to do all the questions, we will come back to you, ladies and gentlemen, with with questions that we don't get time to answer. And also, I appreciate your busy people and you perhaps not going to be able to stick with us for the whole of the presentation. But once can, once we finish today, there will be a recording which will be sent round to, to everybody that's registered to be with us today. So I think that's enough from me, Mark. Um, we're all looking forward to hearing from you. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome Mark Ellis of Appetite Me. OK, good morning all. Thank you for joining us. Um, just to let you know, I'm based over in Suffolk, so if things do go a bit wrong, it's simply down to the fact of our slow internet speed that we uh, have around here. But anyway, I want to talk to you today about rural retail and how we see the future being. And I really want to give you the opportunity to think about possible projects you may wish to consider and some of the questions that you need to ask yourself as we go forward into this presentation. So, OK, so. Rural retail, the business opportunities for 2022 and ahead. So thinking about obviously the rural sector as it is now, the rural sector is worth around about 350 million pounds to the UK market. Um, and this is showing continual growth. And at this moment in time, you know, continues to grow at pace. If we go back to the beginning of COVID and the duration of COVID, farm shops, staycation, uh, all the sectors within in rural retail showed significant growth and the real benefit of what really was demonstrated with rural retail is their ability to change adapt and meet the need so when covid came along lots of farm shops lots of rural retail developed online offer expanded their range did things differently reacted very quickly and therefore really got a, a great growth rate and even with you know hopefully we're seeing coming out of the pandemic these rate, great rates of growth are still there. Like for like sales on last year and two years ago are still strong. And the appetite for people going into the sector continues to grow. Um, and this can be easily demonstrated by the workload that we're seeing coming through our business, uh, the amount of planning portal information that's coming through where people are putting planning permission in for various types of farm shops, garden centres, 
you know, new outdoor restaurants, pop up markets, etc. throughout the UK. Um, and, and I think the public appetite for this continues to grow. And I think COVID, for all the, the terrible things it did do, it really did give a boost to the to this sector in many av av avenues, and it continues to do so. Um, and I think it's driven by many factors, and, and we will cover this off as we go through. And you know, a really good example is if you you know the, the high streets are struggling, but people not only are going online more, but they're going out into the countryside and seeing what's available. And again, we will talk about that in a bit more. Um, I think, you know, why do people like rural retail? I think a lot of it is about the experience. It's the level of service they get. Um, certainly when you go to a farm shop today, the level of service you get tends to be far greater than you would see in our, our major high street supermarkets. Service levels in those are decreasing all the time. You only have to look at Tesco's last week. They made an announcement that they're going to close more delis, butcheries, fishmongers. You know, so the service levels that you see here are diminishing all the time, whereas the great benefit about the rural retail economy is that excellent service that people get. Um, it's also about the surroundings, where you're going to, the beautiful locations, the buildings. It's about the people who operate them and having access to those people. It's being out in the countryside and also people see it as a, 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 the chance to support, you know, the rural economy. It supports local food producers and drink producers. It reduces the food miles. So people, you know, see lots of benefits from doing this. So what is the rural retail sector? We've already said it's worth three hundred and fifty billion pound a year approximately. And, you know, there are just some examples on the screen of what this is made up of. Pubs, cafe, restaurants, farm shops, garden centres and plant nurseries, breweries and distilleries, health, well-being and fitness, artisan food and drink production, independent convenience stores, pop up markets, Airbnb, glamping and camping um, you know these are just some of the examples that you know that go on um, you know my speciality sits within the farm shop garden center nursery cafe restaurant sector specifically um, farm shops continue to grow farm shops adapt you know owners of farm shops are very resilient and very good at adapting to change and they they've demonstrated this wholeheartedly over the over the last two years and they continue to do so now and what we're starting to see now is the online platforms are starting to show a decrease and people are returning stronger than ever to visit farm shops and garden centers and they're looking for you know that great experience back under bricks and mortar so the energy now that farm shops are putting into this is now about the experience when you not when you get there not the fact that there is an online platform there is still a market for it People are still interested in it, but it is about going back to that destination. So why is it growing at such an amazing rate? Well, obviously, the first one is COVID. COVID, you know, has created a completely different market. It's been with us long enough now to cause a seismic change in people's habits. And again, people getting out into the countryside is continuing to grow. And if you go back to a couple of years ago, growth remains very strong and is predicted to remain strong going forward. The love of the countryside. You know, a lot of people have fallen back in love with the countryside over the last two years um, and they continue to do so and they want to get out into the countryside. And it's the perfect time to have that captive audience coming to you and being able to, you know, get something back from it. It, you know, it's seen, as I mentioned earlier, supporting the local economy, whether it be through, you know, a small artisan food producer who's been thinking about doing something for years and this has kickstarted them into doing it. Um, more people are moving out of the cities and into the countryside. We're seeing that very much so in East Anglia and when you go up into parts of Suffolk, North Norfolk. So the number of you know, people are swelling to the countryside. That is helping no end. Working from home, OK, you know, we've now moved on from Plan B and people are encouraging to go back to work. But again, an awful lot of people continue to work from home. And we see that when we're doing, you know, webinar calls like this or Teams calls. A lot of people still work from home and working from home generates an opportunity for those rural sectors to, to gain from that. So where the inner cities have lost trade, people working from home, working from their villages in the countryside or in their towns, there is the opportunity to seize that as well. People retiring earlier, you know, plenty of people were taken out of retirement and there have been, you know, good increases in that from COVID. People finishing work earlier than they plan to. Again, you know, that market is huge. It's an opportunity. They have the time, they have the disposable income. They are looking places to go. 
and their preference will be to go out into the countryside and you know and visit these rural destinations staycation absolutely huge um you know we see this on the amount of interest we're getting from people we look on the planning portals and we continue to this day to see you know hundreds of new applications appear every month for glamping camping caravan sites um, and we'll cover this in a bit more detail later health and well-being getting out fresh air exercise walking your dog you know walk there's a good one on walking the dog i'll just bring up here there are walking um field sites being set up now that are controlled where you can hire a space for a period of time where you can independently take your dog for safe exercise where you can let your dog off the lead you know safe and securely that's another big thing um, and then Brexit. I think Brexit has helped as well. You know, people want to support, you know, homegrown produced food more so than ever. And it's starting, you know, really starting to energise the market. OK, so are there opportunities in the in rural retail? Yes, absolutely. Um, there is no doubt about it. Lots and lots of, you know, things are coming through the pipeline with lots of different ideas. Um, but I think there are a number of questions, you know, before anybody gets into this or thinking expanding. And, and these are just the key ones. What is worth doing? You've got to look at where the gap is in the market. What do people want? What do people need? What isn't happening in the local area? If it's already happening and it's done really well, is there an opportunity to, to fall on the back of that or should it be avoided? Where do I do it? It is all about location. When you do something like this, you know, you've got to be in the right location. You've got to have, you know, the right road access. You've got to have, you know, the pleasant views. You've got to have the infrastructure that you will need to fulfill these projects. How do I do it? Where do I start? You know, you, know, you literally, you know, you'll come up with an idea one day. You need to ask yourself, well, where can I go? Who can I speak to? There are a plethora of people out there who want to share their experiences, who will help you, will guide you. There are consultants, there are numerous people who have lots of ideas. You know, if you were going to do a farm shop, I would say to you, not only go to somebody like me, but Farm Retail Association, who are very good at farm shops, would give you a great steer as to where you'd want to start your journey. And when shall I do it? Well, I would, I would say now, if somebody's thinking of doing a project, bear in mind how long something takes. If you want to do something along the lines of um, glamping, camping, a farm shop, a cafe, you've got to think in terms of a minimum of probably a year, normally two. From that starting process of here's my idea to then looking and creating a business plan, getting a pre-app done, a full plan done, then actually getting the project built, two years. My experience, and I know I'm sure others out there, I know Ian shares this, planning is the biggest challenge out there in terms of time and also their their resource there is a lack of resource within the planning sector or certainly in the, the planning authority sector um, this will cause delays we have planning applications running through the system at the moment that have been in process for two years um, they should take ideally eight to twelve weeks but in some cases you could be talking two years because there is no there's a lack of resource to get this done but it is worth doing it you know if you've got an idea explore it look into it and find out how, you know how to take it forward so in terms of you know things to think about look at what is already in your area what's there already is there a gap in the market so if somebody's already doing glamping there already can you you know is it worth you doing it are you going to offer something different what's not in your area you know when you travel around if you know your local area you believe there is an opportunity because there is nowhere to stay or nowhere to eat, nowhere to buy. Um, that's when you know you need to start looking into that in more detail. Ask local community what they would like to see. What are they missing? Why do they have to travel 20 miles at this moment in time? They need to think about where, what you know, we could, you, we could offer something different. Whether it be glamping, a farm shop, a small cafe an outdoor pop-up market it might even be access you know to space for walking etc what resources do you have you know within your team within your family have you got people who have a hunger to want to do this what particular skill sets do they bring do they have retail experience do they have hospitality experience do they have experience in developing a website it could be as simple as that something that can add value to the project 
and also look at what hasn't worked because you know that some people will do these things and they do go wrong and it unfortunately you know we learn by our mistakes and we can learn by other people's mistakes and when something hasn't worked why hasn't it worked you know look at where you could do things differently it might be the location was wrong it may be the investment was wrong it may be planning conditions were put in place it could be they don't have you know the market is wrong they don't have enough people coming to the area there are numerous things but learn from what other people have done in both a positive and a negative way what can you do what options are there you know most of these on here are all pretty straightforward and sensible glamping a cafe a farm shop a garden center a nursery this could be a plant nursery or this could be a nursery for daycare these are becoming more more and more popular in rural locations artisan food and drink production more and more people you know especially the retired sector where they're, they're looking to do something seize an opportunity where they want to create something they may have bees they want to create honey again this is something that people want to get into health and fitness a whole plethora here you could have outdoor space outdoor gyms yoga retreats wellness centers you name it there are huge opportunities but again it's finding the one that works for you and what will work airbnb continues to grow demand continues lots of people are getting into this it still works and it's like strange what you might think allotments there are people now who want to grow their own and they don't have the space in their gardens but are looking for space Farm shops now are looking to, you know, allocate space out within their uh, project to actually allocate people space for a number of allotments. So the allotment owner would pay a rent every year. They would grow their own fruit and veg. A proportion of that would then feed into the farm shop or into local farmers markets, as well as keeping themselves. And then well-being linked in, obviously, to health and fitness and what people are looking to do by getting out into the country. Um, what makes a successful venture? So we just put a number of things on here that you need to think about. And I'll just run through these. Funding, absolutely, you know, consider the cost. One of the real challenges we are seeing at the moment is the cost of these projects are escalating. Um, and this is probably one of the, the negatives at the moment that, you know, look into it, find out how much it's going to cost, build in a contingency plan because continually costs for materials, staff, labour, continues to rise market trends know the market trends research the market you're going into where is the opportunity what's the road network like can you get to your site relatively easy now there is an argument you know that you don't want you know huge road networks nearby that will make the the appeal of a glamping too noisy but at the same time planning linking in planning road network is important to get this you know project off the ground access accessibility to the site how easy it is to get to the site not just the roads but once you've arrived is it easy to park is it easy to get to where you're going to go uh, staffing consider you know how many staff you're going to need and where you're going to get those staff from what's the availability of staff like um, customer service absolutely one of the key factors here is great service people will come back if they get great service and i think that always has to be the thing that stands out in everybody's mind about how good your service is Customer availability, where are your customers coming from? Again, we just need to check there is a market. Um, you know, somebody will come up with an idea, but if it's not in a holiday location, it's not relatively close to a high number of chimney pots, you know, why would you do something unless you create something, something so different that people will travel? The design and the build of the layout is absolutely key. It has to be appealing, it has to be affordable, it has to be functional, it has to be able to trade properly, and it has to be commercially working. Have a business plan, you know, in those early days, create a business plan, get your ideas down on paper, get some cost projections, use experts who can help you with it to really understand, you know, what kind of capex expenditure you're letting yourself in for and then what the, the trade will be like. Um, and enthusiasm. And I think everybody involved in this project has to show great enthusiasm, you know, People out there want to do these projects, but they have to enjoy working with the public. They've got to be enthused. They've got to be prepared to work the long hours. But if you know, if you incorporate all these things that we've covered here, it's a starting point. These are the things that are key. A successful planning application with, you know, ensuring that when you get a planning application successful, the conditions that are imposed aren't unworkable. A good example of this would be: you build a farm shop. There are conditions imposed. 
you read the conditions and one of the things is you're only allowed to sell product from your own farm. That is going to be a major challenge. But if you get it right and you get the right planning consent with the right conditions, you know, you can do very, very well. Okay, and then I want to move on to garden centres because one, one of the areas that, you know, we want to talk a little bit today, about how popular are garden centres, do they continue to grow? Again, during the pandemic, the early days of the pandemic, all garden centres had to close. They were closed for, I think, around about four months. Um, and obviously that the impact on trade was phenomenal. But the moment the garden centres reopened, you know, they absolutely shot forward. You know, in 2015, the, the market was worth just over four billion. Last year, it's estimated to be around worth about 4.38 million billion. Um, expenditure continues to grow and it says on here 0.5% up to 2020. That includes the period when garden centres are shut. Garden centres last year were seeing in excess of double digit growth. Um, the HTA estimate there are around about 2,300 garden centres within the UK. So lots and lots of people are visiting garden centres and you know I certainly see an opportunity uh, within the garden centre trade if it's something you're considering to take forward. Um, opportunities within the garden centre in World Art, you could do something yourself, start, start something small with a small plant nursery. If you've got land that is available to grow something, then you could grow. There's lots of, you know, the largest garden centre groups, the medium garden centre groups, and also the individuals are looking to expand. We're working on a number of projects at the moment where people, we're buddying up with garden centre operators who want to expand, who want to have new sites, where whether it be on a farm, whether it be on a country estate, whether it be on an established farm shop, they're, they're looking to lease land over a long term basis that will create a large rental income for the owner. It will generate a, a higher degree of footfall to what's already established. Um, you know, and it also links in with what concession space they'd be looking for as well. So, you know, if you've got a couple of acres that are available, this is something that could be considered. And like I say, the operators are looking for new sites. It's not about having garden centres on the edge of towns or cities anymore. It is about working with country estates. It's working with farm shops where there's an opportunity to bolt something onto. So it's worth considering that. This just a very, you know, really simple, straightforward analysis of the market. You know, you go into 2015, where the market was worth just over 4 billion and the projection by 2025 going up to nearly 5 billion. Growth continues year on year. More and more people want to garden. The opportunity is there. The one thing I would say that, you know, garden centres, and we are heavily involved with garden centres, the garden centres are looking, having to do different things. So it would be adding on a food hall. It might be adding on where they haven't got a cafe or a restaurant. It will be looking at bringing new concessions in, whether it be for clothing, whether it be for hot tubs, outdoor buildings, even glamping, that kind of thing. So it, they're looking for new avenue streams where not just gardening, which is their core and their field of expertise, but what else they can add to that offer. Um, and that, that continues to grow. Glamping. <clears throat> is the glamping market saturated? Well, I've broken this down into two areas a race to the bottom and a race to the top. We, we see many, many applications for glamping continuing to go into the system. There are some amazing schemes that are coming out where the habitats, the locations are fantastic, really, really good, and they really are exciting. But on the other hand, you know, there are people thinking, well, the, the staycation market is there. We've got a couple of acres of land in a field. Let's do something. There is, I believe, in a personal opinion, we are starting to, there is a bit of a, a race to the bottom where there are people who are, are taking a basic field, they're dropping in a lot of glamping units, but they're not appealing. Um, so where we talk about, you know, they're sticking to north, using an open field with a little lack of landscaping or interesting views, nothing in the surrounding area that offer values or reason to visit as many close together units as possible to maximise return. But again, this doesn't always appeal to people. They're looking for something a bit different. They're, where planning is easy, they're using, you know, where planning is achievable, is, is an easy access route to this market. The stand, standard of off-shelf design, you know, there are plenty, hundreds of different designs of units that you can get hold of at the moment. 
But again, you know, the, the standard units now, people are thinking, well, what else is out there? Can we have something up in a tree? Can we have something that's half buried? Can we have something that's made out of a container? Can we have something that is two stories? People are looking for different experience and they are prepared to pay as long as they are in an interesting location. And also, you know, people aren't offering the facilities that they need to come and, and create that staycation length. You know, you want to keep people for more than a night or two. You want, you know, the, the duration of a stay to stay between three or four nights. So you then get better value for money. It's less maintenance, less cleaning. So, you know, when we talk about the race to the bottom, this is the market. There are people going after this market that I think is where it's going to going forward. Won't see the kind of growth. Um, because it need, you know, we, we want people to do something encouraging, something interesting. Um, and then the race to the top, think outside the box. So this is what I think, you know, is where the market will really move forward, where people want, where there will be a hunger, where the greatest opportunities lie. Because people next year will return to foreign holidays. But if there's something different in this country, something unusual, so an unusual location, a setting, somewhere where you've got great landscaping. So if you have got a wooded area where you believe some thinning could be carried out and you can drop, you know, units into there, you know, that's something really good. I've, I've got a friend over um, on the Norfolk coast. They've got some old grain silos. They've now created a three story grain silo uh, accommodation units. And on the top level, there is like a decking area that extends out and the views over the North Norfolk coast are absolutely fantastic because they don't use these anymore it's a great opportunity and it's really really proving popular facilities you've got to look at the facilities you offer hot tubs outdoor kitchens whether it links in with rewilding the access to you know whether you hire bikes natural swimming ponds again it's looking for something different tie into other facilities the you know the ability to you know it's not just about the field that it's in. Do you have access to walking area? Can you go off on your bikes and go exploring? Can you offer an outdoor gym? I mentioned outdoor kitchens, all those kind of things. People are looking for something a little bit different. And also, I think it's about capitalising on using, you know, as much of the year as possible. Planning will normally restrict you for a period of time where you can't open normally one month of the year, but it's designing something that can be used for the majority of the year. So you maximise you know, the number of people visiting you and you maximise, obviously, the return on your investment. Also think about the eco credentials in terms of the design, the look, the feel, how they're powered, you know, what the carbon footprint is. Again, people are looking for that, working outside the box. So in summary, when we, we talk about the glamping market, it is growing, it continues to grow. But if you're thinking about going into it, I would certainly recommend, and if budget allows, what can you do different? How can you work outside the box? What is going to be different than a competitor that will really make your site, your appeal with say five pods, you know, what's different? You know, and also the planners may look at it differently as well, that if you're doing something slightly different and it's not the run of the mill, you know, that they will see that as favorable. So yes, I think that it is getting saturated and there are certain parts of the country where, where saturation is is very much there um but there are other parts of the country you know i look around where i am in north suffolk you know there are a number of sites but there's plenty of places where there still are you know still aren't um you know places to go and stay through the glamping so that there are opportunities out there and then finally are you capable of running a retail enterprise i think one of the things is that people need to think about is they may have a great idea they may have a great site but there's lots of things to consider about, you know, are you are you able to do this? Because you've got there's a hunger, a passion, a want and a need. So do you like working with the public? I think that's one of the big questions. You know, if you're going to open up, you know, a farm shop, a cafe, some kind of glamping operation, you've got to enjoy that engagement. And it's really got to excite you that engaging with the public, talking to them, hearing about their experiences, being able to deal with their problems and then learn from what they're telling you. That's absolutely key. You've got to manage a team of people. Now, some people may already do this, but it may be new. You know, if you're going to employ a team of five, six people, you've got to be able to manage those people, motivate those people, drive them, set high standards of what you expect from them, you know, and, and create a team who are passionate about what only what you're doing, what they're doing and be really good at it. 
Most of these things are seven day a week operation. They're not Monday to Friday. You know, they're big at the weekend. You may choose maybe Monday or Tuesday that it doesn't operate in a, a retail sort of sector. But generally, so in the peak season, these are seven day a week operations. So, you know, it's full on. It's in your face. It can be hard work, but it can be very rewarding. Your skill set. Look at what skills you have. You know, do you have any previous experience in running hospitality, retail? Do you have any knowledge of food buying, website design, food safety, food hygiene? Look at what you can offer. Look at what your family have, because that's key to doing this. Understand the business. Understand what you're getting into. Understand the complexities. You know, baked bean, you know, selling, setting up a farm shop is not just about selling baked beans. There are so many things to consider right through from purchasing the product, health and safety, food hygiene, food labeling, uh, managing accounts, managing an EPOS system, clean and tidy, managing a team of people, dealing with the public. Lots to understand. The opportunity to work with the local community is, is really great in these. You know, you set something up you hopefully will be able to work with other businesses who can offer you services, whether it be cleaning services, product supply, it could be IT support, website support, um, product providing. You know, there's a real opportunity here to work with fellow people within your community. The backing of the backing and family support, I think, is key. You know, when we get involved in these projects, we really do look for that synergy of the whole family being behind a project because it is it's a huge effort. Um, and if you want to run it in house and manage it yourself, you know, you need all the family on side. They need to bring their skill to the table. They all need to be able to get on with each other. And, you know, they all need to be singing from the same hymn book. Um, and we've already touched on this, but the time it takes, you know, there are opportunities within glamping to set something up very quickly. And, and you can use, you know, the permitted development rights, whereas last year we were allowed to operate schemes for up to 56 days at the moment. I think it's only going to be 28 days of the year where you could set up a glamping site where you could have people bring camp, uh, camping equipment, caravans, or you could purchase some bell tents. Um, but again, you know, that's something you could do here and now very quickly. But if you wanted to set up, you know, yourself a cafe or a farm shop or a butchery or a gym, these things take time. So if the idea is, is now, you know, it might not be till next year that you can have this thing up and running. So it's got to be the long journey. And whilst you're on that journey, you know, the capital required, where does income come from? You know, how are you going to manage all the different things of your business and how much bandwidth have you got within your operation to not only manage what you're currently doing. So, for example, you know, if you're a farmer and you're running a farm, you've got all that to do. Then all of a sudden you're then managing a farm shop project. How do I manage that? You know, there are people out there who can help you, but it's, you know, expanding your bandwidth. Um, but overall, there's lots of people out there who are very, very capable of doing this. I think it's just a case of looking in the mirror, looking at what skill set you've got, looking at what you can do, what can you offer and work out what you can do really well at and finding that gap in the market. So I think in summary, there are lots of opportunities out there. They only exist in certain areas. Some areas I already have enough. You know, they have enough of, of everything. But is there an opportunity? Is there an opportunity to go and talk to a, a garden centre group and what you know get them to look at a potential site you have on your farm? Do you have a great location that you have where you can put some glamping in? Are you in an area where there are no farm shops? And there are areas where there are, are still few farm shops where there are opportunities that exist. Is that something good new? Does your farm produce something that's you know, that you can sell through the farm shop. Think about that. <clears throat> have you got somebody in the family who's really keen on health and fitness and wants to do something in that line? What can you do? So lots of opportunity, lots of, you know, options out there. And also don't forget the other thing I did mention, there are plenty of grants out there, you know, that you can, you know, home in on and talk to, you know, local business development people within the council you know, about what grants are out there to help get these schemes off. And it's not just monetary, it can be business support, it can be IT support, website development. There's so many things out there. So I think now is the time, as long as you can find the right idea. That's me done. Thank you, Mark. Um, Mark, I, I described you as a um, rural retail expert and you've certainly not um, disappointed in um, in what we're doing before we go on to the 
questions and we've got a few questions. Can I can I just pick up Mark with you mm. on the section what makes a successful venture? Yeah, you did one slide um, um, and two points I'd like to pull out of that. One is funding. It's interesting that at folk to folk we we have a lot of experience at funding not just farm diversification but but retail rural retail business in general and i think one of the um trends we see that the traditional lender is co very cautious when it's a change of direction of a business so take a farm a farm shop for example yeah a farming business they suddenly want to go into hospitality or accommodation there's there's perhaps a reluctance there because it's something new it's new territory and for example your your farm shop uh, your your garden center who then suddenly want to and uh, put in a a farm shop or, or a restaurant again it's a new activity there so it is something we see quite a lot but once that traditional lender can see that business is a it's built it's completed and and it's functioning then that is often there then they are willing to absorb that borrowing into the normal business but it's just an interesting one it's something we see quite often where we can help with that short-term funding in the initial stages yeah. but from your side one thing i think which frightens me as much as anything is staffing <laughs> and if you look, I mean, there there can't be many businesses or industries in this country at the minute who are not short of staff. Yeah. And you know, if I'm and I'm thinking about the the farm shop. If, you, if you've got a butchery department, <laughs> it is it must be a. Yeah, you know, I just don't think any uh, the normal people, if you like, uh, the run of it. Where where would we, we haven't got that skill set ourselves, Mark, to find those specialist people so how, how do we get over that one um i think there's a couple of things you can do i think if you're going to start on a journey where you need a specialist skill set whether it be a chef um whether it be a butcher fishmonger baker planning is key so if you're going to say right we're starting an idea today we're going to open in 18 months time you need to think now about where those skills are going to come from so if it's going to be a butchery and you're going to have a butchery concession within your farm shop you, you know you need to start talking to those butchers now because the butchery businesses want to expand but what they need to understand is when is it going to be and how long is it going to take to train somebody up but what you also need to do is talk about the benefits of working in for example a farm shop whether it be a butcher whether it be a, a cook whether it be a chef i've worked in mainstream food retail seven day a week operation 24 hours a day and if you're a butcher, you could be working a six in the morning shift till two in the afternoon, or you could be doing a two till midnight shift, for example. Come and work in a farm shop. It's great working out. So you've got to go out there and sell what you're trying to do. So the people are out there. You just got to entice them in. And it's not just about the money. It's also about the working conditions. The, the hour, the window that you're open is a lot less. That's appealing. Um, you've got to tie up with local colleges. We've got a project down in Sussex at the moment. We've got a, a, a rural agricultural, agricultural college nearby with a butchery course. So we're in conversations with them about how those people can feed into our farm shops of the future. So if you, you know, up in Norfolk, we've got, you know, colleges, Otley College, one being, and there's another one, I can't think of the name. Again, it's having conversations with them about, you know, can they help you in any way? Um, and it's also about, do you have anybody within, you know, your business you can train as well? Um, but you've got to think outside the box. It is a hell of a challenge. It really is. So, so being realistic, Mark, again, going back to that slide with all the things um, that make you successful, is, is, is it a reality then that even if I'm commissioning a new, uh, a new farm shop, I'm probably going to have to use some specialist providers, specialist yeah. inf inf information <laughs> givers, if you like. So, yeah. you know, you touched on, I mean, and again, that slide we've still got on, you know, food hygiene. I mean, it's another world which it, 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 it's, it's very specialist again, Mark. It, it's very specialist. And like I referred to, it's not just about putting baked beans on the shelf. You know, there are there are people out there who can offer these expertise. You know, Appetite Me, who I work for, we offer a range of skills to get you through this journey. But there are people out there, but you've got 
unless you have all the skill set, you will have to go out there and find maybe that somebody who's going to train all your team in food hygiene and food preparation. You may, you know, and even down to things like manual handling, that kind of thing. You've got to make sure you've got an alcohol license and the people are trained in serving alcohol legally. Um, so there are people out there, it's just a case of, you know, going out there and finding who they are. I'm making also sure they really do have, they understand the rural retail sector. There are people out there who may claim that they know how to design something, but what they don't have is expertise in the rural retail sector. It's a different sector. It's very bespoke. It's very specific. Um, and you need to make sure that they've got experience in that field, which is absolutely key. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, right. So just one. So there's a few questions come in and actually one refers to your um, is a, 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 a carry on, if you like, from your race to the top and race to the bottom with your glamping. Um, I've seen many high quality glamping sites and some basic bell tent sites. Is there a demand for a middle market enterprise? Yes, there is. But I think what you've got to do You've got to just look at what's already in the area. What can you do differently? Can you even if it's something, you know, for example, when you arrive, can you book an afternoon tea delivered to your your accommodation? It's something as simple as that that is proving very popular. So I think, you know, there is something in the middle, but you just got to make sure is, can I make it different? Can I make it quirky? That's right. what I say. OK, um, a lady who runs a farm shop, we have been very successful since lockdown, which has made me think about expanding. Do you have any views on changes in shopping habits? Um, I think what they need to, you know, it's within that case, look at what you currently do, what sells well, what people are, ask people what they want, what are you not doing? You know, what market are you missing out? So is it the fact that you don't do anything uh, non-food, gifting, home furnishing? Are you missing out on frozen food? Is there an opportunity to develop your own ready meal range? Um, so you need is almost, you know, look in the mirror and work out what opportunity there is for you. What are your, you know, look at your repost data if you have it, look at what sells really well and is there an opportunity to increase that? So for example, it might be your alcohol range is only on a four foot bay, very much it's sold very well but people are asking for additional ranges, different products, you know, where you could expand into that. Um, it could be, you know, again, are there ranges that you don't do full stop? It might be, could be things like um, uh, GM, GM free product. It might be gluten free product, you know, all those kind of things you know, is looking at the business. And also, you know, go and look at the competition, see what they're doing. Um, just following on from following on from that, though, Mark, it, 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 we've seen some massive rises in the cost of living in this last six months, which I mean, yeah, for some families that will have a, a genuine, a genuine impact. Can the farm shop trade? Farm shops tend to be slightly up market, I'd suggest, in pricing. Um, do you think that market will still be there or do you? Do you even think that at that level, budgets will get cut? Um, hmm. I think farm, again, I talked earlier about how farm shops have evolved and developed. What we've seen over the last two years, certainly with the pandemic, is that people, farm shop owners have adapted their ranges and expanded their ranges to meet the demand. Now, yes, there is an argument. How do you, you know, you can't suddenly reduce your prices to, you know, but are there possible product ranges you could bring in that I have a different price point. Do you work on the principle that you make more yourself, possibly, where you can reduce the price point? It might be that you have to run some promotions to, you know, make better value for money. But what I would say, even though, the, you know, the cost of living squeeze is there and it's going to get harder, what you've also got to look at is not just about what you charge, it's about the, the experience. When they, you know, people are going to be looking to go out to places now, it might be the fact that going out to a, a theme park is going to become out of their, their territory because it's too expensive. But coming out to a farm shop that has some beautiful walks and has a play area um, and you can go on cycle tracks, that's something to do but is relatively cheap. And then what they would have spent at the play park, you know, 
may be spent on food as the treat. So the treat doesn't isn't going to you know the, the fun part. The treat is actually having some nice food from a farm shop where you can actually see the cattle. So it's about getting people coming through your doors that may have gone somewhere else. Um, but you know, farm shops are not immune to price rises. You know, they're, they're going to feel it. I would say, and certainly my background, if you look at the price increases that are going through core retail at the moment, are phenomenal, and they far outstrip inflation. You know, things are going from one pound to one pound thirty in one foul swoop. Well, inflation is not running at thirty percent, but there is a lot of profiteering going on at the moment. Right. Um, we're not seeing that in farm shops. The price increases that you're seeing in farm shops are genuine increases because of staffing cost increases or production costs, not profiteering like what I believe we're seeing in the, in the main food retail market. Okay. And a uh, final question. Um, and really, you, you have touched on this a little bit there. Um, and that's your experience of gaining planning permission. D do, do you see um, any tangible difference in a business wanting to expand, wanting planning permission to expand, or for a new greenfield site? Is, is one easier than the other, or, or do they both get looked at fairly, do you think? How long have we got here to answer this question? <laughs> um, right. I I operate all over the UK, so I have multiple experiences of multiple planning authorities. Some planning authorities have a really proactive, positive policy uh, or policies that benefit these kind of enterprises. They want to see tourism. They want to see pop-up farm shops, outdoor markets, well-being, um, and they really are encouraging. Um, and they will look at greenfield sites if it works and it fits within the framework and it fits with their policy. Others don't have policies that are specific to farm shops. They have a retail policy that is only linked to food retail supermarkets and town centres. They don't have anything that relates to farm shops. Um, and that's particularly frustrating. Some will say that you have to do something within the curtilage of your farm already within the buildings you have. Sometimes that's not possible because it's a working farm. It just won't happen. Um, so you you have to, you know you have to engage early with the council with a pre-app and find out what they're going to come back to you, what policies are favourable, what policies are negative, and then work through, you know, the, the quagmire that some are to work out what will be the best option. Um, but I think it's really key in the early stages that, you know, once you put a business plan together and you know there's something you want to do, the first port of call is to look into planning. Um, and I think planning is really important. Um, it's frustrating beyond any thing I can, else I can imagine in the process, but they can call, you know, can bring a project to an abrupt stop. You know, you can spend 40, 50,000 on architectural design, planning, consultants, all the application fees, and at the end of it, that money has gone nowhere. Um, so it's important at the beginning that you, you know, you do your research, you do the pre-app, and, and you actually find out if the council is something they're going to support or not. But, you know, you can have one council here and then the council that joins it has a completely different set of policies. And yep. you know, good examples of that down in Oxfordshire as an example where one has a great policy and another doesn't. And, it, and it's stopping. I have a project that stopped a farm shop moving forward. It would be fantastic. Absolutely great for this family and what they're trying to do. But because of the policies don't allow, it's so frustrating. But they'll happily build a little on the edge of the town. And yeah, go. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, hovering in the background somewhere is my colleague Varian. Um, Varian, did, did, are there any other questions that have come in to you, please? Yes, <laughs> thank you for that glamorous introduction. And yes, there is a brilliant question that's come in actually about experiences. Um, so, Mark, the question for you is, are there any add-on rural experiences that have scope for 2022? What do you think will be fashionable this year? And the context of this question, the, the person that's asking has an existing farm based hospitality business. So if you could answer it in the context of that, that would be brilliant. Um, Thank you. I think there are. And I, one of the things that really has interested me lately, um, just outside London, near around the Barnet, right next to the M25, um, there is 
an expansion of, I very quickly touched on dog walking, secure dog walking. If you have a dog in London, where do I take my dog where I can let it off the lead safely? There is nowhere. There are these places popping up all over the place now, which takes a couple of acres of land that is secure. Um, you book a slot for half an hour, you pay a fee, you go, your phone lets you in, you let your dog off the lead. It's for your exclusive for use only. These things are becoming incredibly popular. The one I saw down in Barnet, near Barnet, right on the M25, opened and within hours, every slot was filled going forward. It's, you know, and you're talking revenue, you know, probably talk, I don't know, revenue per week, anything up to a thousand pounds, um, if you get it right with the right facility. I think that's one thing. Um, I think what else is, is going to be good? You know, I go back to the glamping. I think there is an option for glamping, but you've got to think outside the box. You've got to think, what have I got differently? Have I got, you know, a pond that we can convert into an outdoor swimming pond? Have we got, you know, somewhere where people can, you know, whether you, do, you link it in with cookery demonstrations, you tie in with a local butcher or a local restaurant and offer, you know, cooking schools, that kind of thing. Um, it, yeah, it is a tough question. I'm just trying to think of anything else that stands out to me at the moment. Um, one, I tell you, one of the interesting things is slightly different in vineyards. We've got a number of clients at the moment who are developing vineyard experiences where people can come along and actually get involved in some of the processes of the vineyard and, and learn about, you know, grape growing, wine production. So I think that's quite a key thing as well. Um, so they're there, you know, they're, they're not, I was going to say, a lot of things have been covered. You just got to look for something different, I think, is the answer. Um, but what so, do you think about, Mark, what do you think about sort of ride on type experiences? Um, I think you, as in like motor Se segway type type things. I think again, if you've got something like that, you could if you've got the the land, you've got the space. Uh, you need to consider the health and safety and insurance aspect of it. I think that's a big thing. You know, there are the traditional off road. You know, the, the the mountain bike routes. We're working on a project in Wales at the moment, which is linked into that. Again, I think that there is an opportunity. Um, you know, there are experts out there who you know you can talk to and come up with you know some great schemes i think also outdoor play um outdoor play is not just the climbing frame anymore it it's far beyond that it's an experience it's doing something different it's having a real theme about your outdoor play center yeah they, they are expensive to set, but they really do draw in a lot of people um we're talking to some people down in devon at the moment and that's exactly what we're working on there they want to create an outdoor play area that is very bespoke, very specific to the area and has a theme. There's a number of themes being considered from, um, you know, all to do with uh, airports. It could be uh, rescue, you know, where it all links in with that. So there are things you just, you just I say you just got to find the right one. That, it's an interesting question that you raise, Varian, that, that, that's raised there, because as you know, we, we've done, we've not touched on it um, during this webinar, but, um, you know, the equine, the equine sector, I mean, as you know, we've funded quite a lot of, of um, new livery operations, and, and really that's a, that's a change in there is a change in society really it's, there's less it's it's becoming more unsafe to ride on the road mm. becoming more the little farms in the villages which would have done livery have all disappeared so that it's a, it's a bit more of evolution again mark isn't it of how these things have got you know it keep you've got to keep refreshing and yeah, yeah you make a point on your website about um refreshing and and keeping your your business you know current really there is um, there is a very good example is down outside Swindon, a place called Rain and Shine, I believe they're called. Um, they have a riding school, um, very, very successful. I've been to it myself. They have 30, 40 horses. It's packed all day long or evenings, weekends with children, adults going, learning to ride off, you know, um, pony trekking. But they're looking to roll out this concept. They are looking for new sites. And, and rain and shine, they're called Baited Swinner. And they and they want to take this model forward. 
you know they're looking for new sites all over the uk that they can co-partnership with other farmers you know who've got building who've got land who want to set this up um and it's proving really really successful and then what you also do you add on to it a little cafe a bit of a retail offer they're also adding a glamping operation into it as well so you can come and stay a couple of days and then go riding every day so that, there's a real opportunity i forgot that one that's one really worth looking at um, Mark, we're, uh, we're, um, we're getting on with time a little bit. Could you just move that last slide on a bit, Mark? Because there should be some contact, some contact yep. details for people um, somewhere in that, in that sequence. There we go. Yeah, there we are. So um, there are ladies and gentlemen. If, um, we've, we've been very lucky to have Mark um, with us this, uh, this morning. Um, and Mark, thank you. Um, I know how busy you are. Um, um, but we do appreciate yeah, the, 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 what you've brought to us this morning. Um, contacts are there, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to follow anything up. Um, as I said, this will be recorded and that, that will be available once we, we, we wrap up here. Um, I'm just thinking for some of you that may still be interested in dipping your toes in the water, one of our earlier webinars, which was still available, was with PitchUp, where we were looking at the opportunities of having a 56 day campsite on, on your land. Um, lobbying still going on to keep that 56 day limit in place. Uh, but however, even, even so, you can have a pop up for 28 days. And we heard some remarkable um, examples last year of the amount of money it was quite staggering what some of these people had taken in a in a very short time so that is still available and um, it might just be worth a listen to to see what um, was said there our next um, webinar um, is something completely different and we'll be looking at foreign exchange <laughs> and uh, next that will be at 11 a.m on tuesday the 15th of march and from everybody here, I think thank you for joining us, particularly thanks to you, Mark. Um, thank you, Barry, and being in the background and making it all work. Have a good day. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>